All right, this is our last concept for this unit, and um, for all time, which is crazy, we're going to be talking about relationships between organisms and different organism interactions like predation and competition and symbiosis. This will be the same notes for up, um, CP and honors because it's pretty simple content, really can't make it more advanced for honors, um, although you'll have more challenging assessments as always. I love this because most people will assume the whole, all biology is about plants and animals, and of course there's subsets of biology that are, but for us, this is pretty much all we talk about plants and animals, mainly, is right here. So here we go, get excited. All right, so why do organisms interact at all? Well, within an environment, we talked about evolution and all these things, there's limited resources. So many organisms end up sharing a habitat. And a habitat is the actual area in the ecosystem where they live. And, and it includes all the living and non-living parts of their space. So the abiotic and biotic resources. But organisms have their own niche. And I'm going to say niche like we do in the South because it's just a lot easier to say. And I just don't like the way niche sounds and how it sounds coming out of my mouth. So they all have their own unique niche. All right? And a niche is all of the things an organism needs and does within its habitat. It's kind of like its role. So think, most of you live in a house or an apartment or a condo or whatever, um, that is your habitat and you share it with other people. You share it with um, maybe your parents, your grandparents, or your cousins, or your siblings, or whatever. Maybe you have a dog you share it with. There are bacteria in your house that you share it with. You may have some potted plants. Um, so all of those things are a part of your habitat. But each of you has your own niche in your house. So in my house, it's just me, my husband, and my dog, and a bunch of bacteria, I'm sure, because I'm not the cleanest. You know, my dog has the role of being the selfless contributor of unconditional love in our family. I have a role of cooking, and, you know, I also work, but I do, I have other things. My husband help, does all the yard work, and he's kind of the fun one. We each have our own little niche in our habitat. We don't share a niche, but we do share a home. So that's kind of how they interact. So we're going to kind of see how, because they can't share a niche, this can create some different dynamics. And because they do share habitat, that'll create other dynamics. So that's what we're going to see as we go through some of these relationships. The first is predation. And I love these pictures. It's not even really a relationship at all because it's not long term. Predation is when one um, organism or animal kills and eats another for food. The predator is the one hunting or killing. Um, the prey is what's being killed or consumed. So examples. Um, so many things you can think of. Here we've got the owl being the predator. The mouse is the prey. We've got a bear as a predator. The fish is a prey. Some of you are predators. If you hunt deer or other ducks or whatever, that's the prey. Those are just some examples. And a predator-prey graph shows kind of the cycling of populations over time and how predator and preys respond to each other. So um, here's the predator-prey chart showing over time and the change in populations. The solid line is the prey and the dotted line is the predator. And what you're going to see just right off the bat is that the predator line is pretty much dependent on the prey because the prey is the food source. So as the prey line increases, then the predator line can increase. As the prey starts to decrease, that causes the predators to decrease. But then prey can increase, and then predators can decrease. So it's kind of always responding to the other. So at point A, you know, what's happening right here? We see that predators have hit their peak. But as they hit their peak, if there's a ton of predators, that's going to cause the prey to decrease because they're going to get eaten. So they're going to start decreasing also. At point B, we see the predators are decreasing due to low amounts of prey. But that's going to in turn allow prey to start increasing as they're hunted less. So you can see kind of how it's this back and forth relationship. Another type of interaction or relationship we see is competition. And this is a relationship that exists between two or more organisms that are fighting for the same limited resource. And they could even be fighting for the same niche. And it kind of comes in two forms. Interspecific competition is competition between different species. Think international is different nations. So this would be like a cheetah and a lion competing for elk as food. 
intraspecific competition is competition occurring within the same species. So think intramural sports. When you go to college, there'll be intramural sports. So there'll be different teams of students all from the same college playing against each other. So they're from the same college, but they're competing against each other. That's intramurals. Um, this would be like two bears competing for the same fish or two lions competing for the same elk, that kind of thing. One more thing about competition is the competitive exclusion principle. So we said that no two organisms can occupy the same niche at the same time. If organisms are really different, one's just probably going to be a better fit than the other for that niche or for that resource. And so it's probably, this may not even be much of a fight. It just may naturally take over. But if the organisms are really similar, they're going to fight to see who can get the niche or who can get the resource. And the loser is either going to die or it's going to have to migrate and go on to get a resource or a niche somewhere else. And this is called the competitive exclusion principle. So they'll fight until one's excluded. And think about the Lion King. So spoiler in the Lion King, Simba and Mufasa are competing to be the king of the pride because there can only be one. And at the end, there's a big fight, and um, Simba wins, and he becomes king of the pride. And I think Mufasa dies. He may move somewhere else. I honestly don't remember because I haven't seen the movie since, like, 98. But that's basically what happened. They fight, and one gets excluded. All right, and then another category of relationship is symbiosis. And this is any interaction that is close, physical, long-term, in between two different species. So it's always interspecific, and one organism is always benefiting. Um, so there's kind of three types. First is parasitism. This is a really gross picture. So if you need to cover it up, do it. But I had to show you because it's so nasty. This is when one organism, the parasite, benefits from the relationship, and the other organism, the host, is harmed. So examples. This could be like ticks or even ringworm in dogs or other mammals that suck the blood from them. The mammal or the dog is the host, and then the tick or the tapeworm could be the parasite. Um, also, we've got fleas on this cat, too. Now, one thing that's really interesting is that in a parasitic relationship, the parasite doesn't want to kill the host. All right? Pause and think. Why would that be? Because in order for the relationship to continue, you don't want to kill the host because then you would lose your food source and you'd have to go find another. So parasites want to keep their hosts alive long enough for them to survive and then spread into another resource. So this is what's different from predation and parasitism. Parasitism is long term and they want to keep the host alive, whereas predation is more of an event and it's a short term thing and they kill their, um, their prey immediately. But in both of these, it's a plus minus relationship. One's benefited and one is harmed or killed. Another type of symbiotic relationship is commensalism. And this is when one organism is benefited while the other is just unaffected. It's not helped or harmed. Um, an example on this picture are um, barnacles that grow on mollusks or snails or clams or any of those things in the ocean. You know, the um, barnacles benefit because they can, move, they can be carried to different places to reproduce. The shells on these clams and mollusks and snails aren't really that affected hurt or harmed. So we would say this is a plus zero relationship in terms of one being benefited and one unaffected. And then last and honestly one of the most common because it you think it kind of makes sense for mutualism to be the most common because it's when both are going to benefit. They're both helping each other survive so they should both be reproducing more and thus passing on this mutualistic relationship. So examples are like clownfish and anemones. Um, clownfish live in the anemones, so the anemones provide a home and some protection for the clownfish. Um, clownfish bring in food um, to the anemone um, and food sources as they kind of swim in and out um, in terms of like algae and other microorganisms too, but they also can clean the anemone also, so they benefit each other in that way. And that is relationships and ecological interactions.